So, hi everybody. Thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today. My name is Ignacio Neri. I am from Mexico and I will complete the map. I will the management program at Colombia in June. After completing the program, I will join Verdon Partners, uh, an investment banking boutique firm specializing in energy transition as director. And moreover, I have been working in investment banking, mainly in mergers and acquisitions and break finance in the infrastructure and energy sectors for the last nine years. And that being said, along with the support from the Colombia Climate School, especially from Adrian Kenyon and Omar Herrera, and from Colombia's Environmental Entrepreneurs Club, I organized this panel both for my Colombia fellows and for the public to discuss the pertinence and challenges of geoengineering as an alternative path to mitigate the short-term effects of climate change. Geoengineering, sometimes called climate engineering or climate intervention, is a broad term encompassing various technologies aimed at intentionally altering the Earth's climate system. It is seen as a potential strategy to help mitigate the effects of climate change. There are two primary categories of geoengineering. The first one, solar radiation management, and the second one, carbon dioxide removal. In this webinar, we will examine two types of solar radiation management techniques. The first one corresponds to the initiative led by Dr. Field, surface albedo modification, which is the concept of increasing the albedo value of land masses by covering the land with reflective materials. The second one corresponds to the initiative led by Andrew Song, a stratospheric aerosol injection, which involves injecting reflective particles into the upper atmosphere to reflect sunlight before it reaches the surface of the Earth. This technique resembles the effects obtained from volcanic eruption, such as the one that is currently happening in Mexico with the Popocatépetl volcano. Geoengineering or climate intervention offers several potential advantages in the fight against climate change, such as the capability to rapidly mitigate its effects on a large scale, possibly impacting global temperatures and weather patterns significantly in a relatively short time. It also brings to the table cost effectiveness compared to other mitigation strategies while enabling targeted intervention in specific areas. However, it is important to stress that geoengineering is not a silver bullet. It comes with a range of considerable technical, political, and ethical challenges, and there are significant uncertainties and potential risks associated with many of its techniques. Furthermore, there are potential downsides such as intended, unintended consequences on regional weather patterns. It could even have substantial geopolitical implications with countries possessing the necessary technology and resources, potentially gaining an strategic advantage on a geopolitical level. Hence, the effective deployment of engineering techniques necessitates a comprehensive governance framework which outlines clear roles, responsibilities, oversight, and regulatory mechanisms, while ensuring public participation and input. In that sense, while geoengineering is a promising mitigation strategy that can buy time for more permanent climate change solutions, it necessitates a cautious, collaborative approach and should not replace the emphasis on reducing GHG emissions. That being said, allow me to introduce you to today's panel. Starting with Dr. Leslie Field. She's an expert in climate solutions, ice and water management, microelectromechanical systems, catalysis, and energy. Dr. Field holds a Bachelor and Master of Science in Chemical Engineering from MIT and holds a PhD and Master of Science in electrical engineering from UC Berkeley, and has vast teaching experience having delivered a decade-long seminar on engineering and climate change at the Stanford University, a course often described as highly impactful by students. With industry experience at Hewlett-Packard Labs, focusing on microelectromechanical systems and microfluids, 
Dr. Phil founded and managed two successful consulting companies, MEMS Insight and Small Tech Consulting. In pursuit of climate solutions, Dr. Phil established the nonprofit Bright Eyes Initiative, following a 16-year tenure leading the nonprofit Ice 911 Research slash Arctic Ice Project. Dr. Field is a prolific inventor with over 60 patents and has authored present numerous peer-reviewed papers and technical conference talks at the STEAM venues such as the UN, the International Maritime Organization, a World Economic Forum affiliated event in Davos, an exhibit at COP26, and talks and sessions at the Arctic Circle Assembly and Cryosphere 2022 in Reykjavik Island. Continuing with the Make Sunsets co-founder, Andrew Song's professional journey commands with his BA in economics from NYU and has since traversed numerous notable ventures. Notably, he was the first sales hire at Welcome and Haysack Analytics, a community operations manager at Scale AI and co-founder of Magic Instruments where he successfully launched a guitar that could be played in under five minutes, resulting in $500,000 in revenues within only two months. His contributions extend to Indiegogo, where he imparted knowledge on crowdfunding, and Drop, where he generated over $1.25 million in gross merchandise value within months. His diverse skill set includes software as a service, artificial intelligence, consumer hardware, and crowdfunding. His work has always centered, centered around innovation and customer satisfaction. Finally, the moderator of the panel, Kat Clifford. She's a climate innovation and technology reporter in New York City with 18 years of experience in journalism having been associated with major publications like CNN, CNN Money, Entrepreneur, and CNBC. She has adeptly covered a variety of sectors and has written fast-breaking news stories in addition to in-depth, character-driven feature stories. In 2016, she joined CNBC as one of the first hires to help launch CNBC's digital project, CNBC Make It. Most recently, Kat helped launch the climate section at CNBC in the summer of 2021. And since then, she has been exclusively covering climate innovation and technology. She covers the energy transition, which includes renewable energy, nuclear power, and geothermal energy, and the issues surrounding the bottleneck in transmission line construction in the US. She has also been covering developments in new industries like carbon removal and storage technologies and clean hydrogen production, to name two examples. And it, as is particularly relevant to this panel discussion, geoengineering. Her dedication to leveraging her journalistic skills to contribute to humanity's collective response to climate change is deeply admirable. Kat earned a BA in art history from Columbia University. Now I give the floor to Kat, who will be moderating the discussions. And please, we will be collecting your questions. Uh, so you will have the option menu for the Q&A down in, 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 in your screen. So please shoot all of your questions right there and we will compile them and distribute them by the end of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really pleased to be here and talk about solar geoengineering uh, with all of you. Um, first of all, you know, uh, geoengineering can have many different forms. So uh, I'd first like to have each of our uh, guests describe um, what they are doing. So what what specifically their their work is. How, describe it for us. So. Um, uh, Andrew, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, so yes, I'm the co-founder of Make Sunsets. We launch reflective clouds into the stratosphere to cool Earth until humanity can figure out how to decarbonize the economy as well as trans transition away from fossil fuels and remove the existing greenhouse gases that we've put up in the atmosphere since the 1870s. And so uh, essentially what we do is we currently use weather balloons to deploy our SO2, which is the active ingredient in volcanic eruptions that cause... Um, 
uh, uh, cooling. And so essentially, um, we've started with, uh, we've, we've, we were founded back in October 2022. Uh, we've so far launched 18 balloons and offset about 2,800 tons of CO2 for a year. Uh, and that's the warm, warming effect of uh, CO2. Uh, we are not taking away or uh, pulling out any CO2 from the atmosphere. So I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, we're, the, we're essentially the, the Band-Aid, uh, the tourniquet, until we can transition away from fossil fuels as well as uh, scale up carbon dioxide removal. And just a couple more uh, quick questions before we move to Leslie. Um, just to so that um, listeners understand, have you raised have you raised money? Where where's the funding for this coming from? Sure. So we um, come from the startup world uh, in tech, and uh, essentially our investors are Boost VC, which is a was an early investor of Coinbase, um, and also Pioneer Fund. And um, we actually closed some more additional funds, but we're not ready to. Um, uh, announce that yet, but overall we've raised uh, $1.25 million. Uh, and this has happened in the last seven months or so. And last uh, sort of logistical question so that people understand before we move to Leslie, um, are you attempting to make money? Uh, and if so, uh, how? Yeah, so uh, we are actually live right now. So if you want to buy a cooling credit, you can come to our website, makesunsets.com. And so we have 96 customers. Uh, it's a really interesting group of people. What I've described them so far, I've talked to like at least 80% of them. Um, and what I've what I've found is that they're like climate dads or climate moms. They talk about solar, they talk about wind, they talk about alternative energies, heat pumps. Maybe they have a Tesla in the driveway. They definitely have kids uh, and are worried about the future uh, of these kids. And so, uh, but these are people who have PhDs in physics. Um, one is a graduate from Caltech and PhD, has a PhD from there. Um, these are white collared uh, people who um, really understand what we're doing and are supporting us. And so if you think by the end of this, uh, this conference, uh, uh, you'd like to offset your carbon footprint, check out makesunsets.com. And so they're paying for, so just uh, they're, so that uh, listeners understand. So sure. their customers are paying for deployment. For, for deployment. So essentially one gram, so the weight of a dollar bill. So one gram offsets the warming effect of one ton of CO2 for a year. So one to million leverage. This is the claim that David Keith has made, which is a leading scientist in stratospheric aerosol injection. He's currently at University of Chicago. Um, and we're basing all these claims off his work. And so we deployed these clouds that are 20 kilometers up. And so- during our next launch, if you'd like to purchase a cooling credit, it's refundable before then, but essentially you can buy a cooling credit. We will then deploy that balloon into the stratosphere for you guys. And you can essentially offset the warming effect for one ton of CO2 or more if you'd like. Okay. Okay. So um, Leslie, if you could tell us, tell the listeners um, what it is in what variety of solar ge geoengineering you are working on and, you know, explain what it is that you're doing. Yeah, thank you. And really glad to be here. Uh, we often get lumped under the same title of geoengineering and solar radiation management. And you know, you can call many things geoengineering, including farming. We're, we're very different. Um, I wanted to do something that had a very different risk profile and uh, looked as safe as, as humanly possible. And so I've been concentrating from the beginning on trying to uh, keep ice from melting. We've had for free this, this wonderful reflective icy heat shield in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and in the glaciers around the world that are safely reflecting away a lot of sunlight. And the fact that they keep melting and keep accelerating their melting is driving temperature rise much, much faster than it would otherwise. And so the thought was, well, let's keep it natural. Let's keep ice in the ocean or ice in the glaciers and let's do it with as natural a material as we can and in a way that could be reversed if we ran into some kind of unintended consequence. So basically on the ground, we put a material that's made out of basically uh, the, the materials that go into most of the rocks on this, on this planet, um, silica, silica, silica based uh, material. And it's called hollow glass microspheres is the one that we've tested the most. 
And what's nice about those is it's mostly, you're mostly reflecting from the air bubble or, or gas bubble in the middle of it. Got a terribly thin shell of something that we've all evolved with because it's present in, you know, silica is present in most ecosystems on earth. And it doesn't have any of, uh, you know, any hazardous issues of crystallinity um, because it's made into a glass, which means that it's, it's not the kind of material that, that hurts. And it's also large enough. You can choose things that are large enough. What I showed you looked pretty thin. It is, but it's large enough that it doesn't, you know, pose any inhalation risk. So, so we got something that's as safe as we possibly could do, and we put it in very thin layers on top of ice, and it makes the ice last longer. And so, if we did find some unintended consequence, we would be able to see that very quickly and do something about it. We always also work with permissions. As you mentioned kindly, you know, I'm an inventor and I've invented a bunch of things and I've always wanted to have guardrails around, you know, inventors fall in love with what we do, right? And you want other people deciding, is this a safe enough thing to do? You know, where can I get my permissions from to do this work? Can I have local collaborations and indigenous collaborations where, where indigenous people are living so that we're making sure we're doing the right things? And that's been a very careful route we've always done. Um, I, I will say the thing that we, I've done recently, why I changed to a new nonprofit recently, to, and it's always been nonprofit work, is we never could get permissions to work on ocean ice, on sea ice directly, but that's a very key lever. And, and given that, you know, we won't work on sea ice, okay, until things change. We are now working on uh, glacial ice where we've been invited to work in a couple locations. And uh, very excitingly, it looks like things are coming together to be able to work on ice in the Himalayas where we can do a profound amount of good if this is working out well um, to help the water supply of over a billion people and the food supply of something like a third of the world. And so uh, being able to help with local resilience is terrific. And we have actually, as part of our team, someone who grew up in that area, she's indigenous to that area and happens to be an environmental impact assessment specialist along with a glaciologist from this area as well. So uh, who works, uh, who's worked in that area for 30 different expeditions. So that's pretty exciting to, to get to do that. And where, where is it? You, you know, you mentioned that, uh, where, where are you doing this, this work? Yeah, so the, uh, the uh, documents that have been submitted now to the Indian Institute of Technology, uh, what, one of their branches there, um, is for Chota Shigri Glacier, and that's in the Western Himalayas. It's up high. Um, I'll be using all my backpacking <laughs> goodness experience there and happy that we have an experienced mountaineer with us as well, you know, certified. Um, but that's gonna be very interesting and it's gonna be a very teeny tiny test um, and, and well permissioned uh, to do this. So that's pretty and exciting. Oh yes, yes, and um, so I so that uh, I and the rest of the listeners understand. How, how, where's the money for this coming from? How how are you funding this project, and and who's who's paying? Yeah, so it's a nonprofit by design. Uh, you know, part of that was the strategy way back was there's no way in the world you're going to get uh, permissions to work on oceanic or sea ice things without being a nonprofit. So let's just go with it and be a nonprofit. Um, and it's, uh, you know, concerned people in our community uh, where we finally have done enough proof points to prove to myself and our team that we have a good chance of working on a very different environment than we'd aimed for initially. It's not flat, it's going to be very steep. And we've got some very good proof points that that's a very good possibility. So now we've started approaching foundations. And uh, you know, that will get in a more solid money stream. Uh, it's been a very, very lean start, but I didn't want to be raising money until I was pretty sure what we were going to do was going to work and that we'd be getting the permissions to do it. So, so it's an exciting time right now. And this is, and so, so as you mentioned, this is a nonprofit. So what you're doing is, is to collect data. It's, is, is that correct? Is that, uh, do you know that this, are you looking to collect data in terms of how much 
this process reflects Sun or is that, is that the goal of what you're doing? Obviously it's a nonprofit. It's not, you know, you're not looking to make a, a money with this. That's right. I mean, hopefully we will eventually earn at least some part of a living from this, but yeah, right now uh, we're volunteering and uh, it's uh, and it's hard work, but what we do is we transparently share what we learn with the scientific community, with policymakers, and uh, we are, uh, you know, we've been publishing uh, in AGU journals in particular. That's where many, many climate scientists gather to share their data. So AGU, American Geophysical Union, we had a good paper out in uh, late uh, December uh, last year, which was, which is a nice, impactful one showing what we could do on a homeowner pond in Minnesota, which is a self-contained area uh, that he built when he built his home and that he and, and our team have been instrumenting and experimenting on for quite some time. And that's a really nice solid, solid data set. Um, and yeah, the idea is to establish how much can we delay melt? Um, can we over time rebuild melt is uh, we think a really good possibility if you can slow it enough in glacial regions or on sea ice, you, you start to have the potential to rebuild it over time. And that would be a really natural and lovely leverage point if you could. Otherwise, as we lose all this reflectivity and things get darker and darker as we're darkening the planet, um, we are absorbing more and more solar incoming solar radiation. And so things just keep accelerating and getting hotter. It's no it's no accident that as ice has disappeared in an accelerating way in the Arctic, the global temp the rate of global temperature rise is higher in the Arctic than I think anywhere else. Something I've heard things like six to seven times the global average there. And it's because localized these these effects are really having their impact there. So uh, for both of you now, I, uh, I'd like to hear, uh, you know, first from Andrew, you know, the, the why, what's your why? Why are you doing this? You, you know, we got your bio um, at the beginning from Ignacio and you've done a lot of things. So, um, you know, why this and, and why now? Um, why this? It's, it just seems like it's the most leveraged way to combat climate change. Um, again, one gram of SO2 deployed at stratosphere can offset the warming effect of one ton of CO2. Um, that's, I mean, if that's not compelling to try and pull that thread, um, I don't know what is. Um, clearly, I grew up in, in the era where, you know, we were taught to, you know, recycle, reduce, reuse, um, and, you know, care about our carbon off rates, but off, uh, offset in our, our footprints um, to do all these things. But really, it was just, was not anything impactful. Um, seeing, you know, much more smarter, accomplished colleagues, uh, scientists working on this for 30 years. And no one's, I mean, honestly, like we've only increased our usage of CO2, I mean, output of CO2 into the atmosphere. And so clearly nothing is like, we're, we're not changing course. Um, and as a father of uh, two young children, two, three and four years old, um, I deeply care about their futures. And so if, if my actions today, even though we've just started right back in October, 2022, um, can actually unlock this logjam of just this this um, hand rain of thinking that, hey, we need to do something about this. Uh, let's run more models. Let's run more experiments. Let's do more lab research. Um, I've become fed up. And so I'm taking this matter into my own hands. Um, we are speaking with the top scientists in the world as we do this. So, and we're not breaking any laws. Um, there is no permissions. To, uh, this is the weirdest part of this entire like company is that there are no permissions other than when we launch and we call the FAA every single time we do that. And so um, other than that, there are no guidelines. And so the way that I look at this is the same as how AI is currently being um, not regulated, but you know, currently being questioned. Is this going to take everyone's jobs? But I've been working in AI since 2014. And I understand, you know, it was a big deal back then. A lot of money was pouring into it. But until ChatGPT came around, it was something that wasn't significant to regulate, right? Uh, before that, it was just trying to teach maybe cars how to self-drive or do something like that. But again, small-scale testing. This is 
chat GPT has kind of changed course, like changed the course of humanity, in my opinion. And so we are still at this very early stage of where we're at in terms of stratospheric aerosol injection in particular. Um, I know there are um, universities, obviously researching this, that have been researching this since the 70s, but no one has actually done deployment. And that's why, why I'm talking to you guys today is because we've done something significant in the sense that we've deployed. I mean, Kat, you've covered us in the news. You've seen the press that has come out of it. I don't think I could spend a million dollars and get the press I could get unless we did something significant like this. And so, um, but correct me if I'm wrong there um, on, on, the, on the press coverage. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I don't know exactly how the, how the, you know, fi financial spend to, to press coverage, you know, correlates, but you have gotten a lot of, of coverage from many different outlets. And I think that's because it's a sort of, uh, you know, there is some controversy surrounding the, the whole idea. People are unsure what it means. They don't um, know that it maybe is perceived of as, uh, you know, not actually fixing the problem. This is a lot of the feedback that that I hear whenever I uh, sure. publish stories is that, you know, it's can, kind of seen of as um, not addressing the root cause. So right. I think that's why there's some controversy and there has been a lot of coverage of, of what you guys are working on. Um, and Leslie, why are you doing this? Um, you know, what what's 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 your reason for working um, on this particular area uh, of reflectivity um, and, and why are you working on it now at this point in your career? Yeah, so I'm working on climate because my kids were six and 10 years old when I saw the Al Gore movie in 2006. And I looked at them, it was, I've been an environmentalist forever, you know, Sierra Club, all that. I, gee, the first Earth Day while I was, you know, in school was just, it was a lovely thing. And uh, I've always, always been concerned, but I didn't get it, how bad things were until I saw the Gore movie and realized that even here in California, living at a thousand feet above sea level, my kids' lives were going to be terribly affected if somebody didn't do something. And I didn't see much getting done, uh, but I am an inventor. And, you know, I, I got to ask myself that question, if not me, who, if not now, when, and realized, well, with all that lovely schooling that you've been outlining, right? Um, uh, why not give it a try? And so I, I started learning as much as I could at Stanford. I'd become a consulting prof there at that point. And so I got to talk with experts and I got to learn that indeed ICE was one of the biggest in peril things that had been doing this this great favor for so long for for all of human history i think um of reflecting away an awful lot of sunlight and if we could do something about that we could solve a lot of the problem um one thing i noticed in the chat uh earlier somebody's been asking will the hollow glass microspheres turn into plastics and i just have to answer that right now this is a very different material and I used my chemical engineering background to know, hey, you know, if you can allow evaporative cooling, you can cool things off. And that would probably be a very good thing for keeping ice in place better. And so glass was the right, was the right choice. Silica was the right choice, something that's wettable. It's like the vinegar in your oil and vinegar salad dressing, right? It's not the oil. And I wanted something that wouldn't attract oil-based pollutants. And I wanted something that would allow this evaporation and that turned out to be very good but that means that it's extremely different material than plastics plastics do attract oil-based pollutants they're in that family they're intrinsically poisonous by and large and the uh the this sort of thing this this glass-based thing is not it's it's this made of from silica which you know is i think the second most abundant material on earth so we, we, we all evolved with it, so we're fine there. Um, as to why I keep going on this, the feedback, you know, if something keeps accelerating in a bad way, that tells you that if you could stop that and possibly even reverse that, you can drive things in a good way. And uh, that's something, you know, it's localized. Uh, if we do find there's some unintended consequence, we can do something about it. And it's trying just to do the most natural thing to preserve the most natural, you know, reflector we've had there on the planet. Is it a Band-Aid? Absolutely. I mean, do we need to still 
transition to sustainable fuels, absolutely. But transitioning a whole infrastructure that's been built up for many, many decades now over to something different is going to take time, even once we get serious. And my God, I wish we'd get serious now about that. There isn't much time left. It, I've had it explained or, or described to me that this climate change is the one field where the experts are far more worried than the general public, because the experts know that the timelines keep closing. We used to say 2100 and then 2050. And, you know, recently it's like, well, we might have three to five years. You know, that's not a lot of time to make some major changes. And that's really necessary. And if we actually bent all our political and individual wills towards that, maybe we could get the job done, but we haven't done that yet. So I appreciate you're getting out news like this. Yeah, well, so, you know, I think both of you, while you have different approaches um, and different pathways, um, you know, you're both sort of articulating the same idea. Um, I like the, the use of the word Band-Aid, um, that this is a, uh, this is, this is, um, you know, not, and, and this is why, as Andrew, you mentioned, you've gotten uh, more, more press coverage than, than you could, you could pay for, you know, I think the fact that this is a, a band-aid, the fact that it is uh, a temporary, uh, pro e e each, each of your approaches are temporary ways to buy more time. They are not in and of themselves solutions is what makes this whole field um, controversial and um, gets people, uh, you know, emotional. And so I think, um, what is your strategy, both of you, in communicating that effectively? Um, and then, uh, so first I'll start with with Andrew, um, what is sort of your strategy and how do you communicate about the very fact that this is not going to permanently, you know, fix climate change? Right. Um, and then inherent in that is sort of the second part of my question. And, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, what are the potential harms? You know, what are the potential risks? Because I think you know, we need to be honest here about what are the potential risks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, first off, uh, yeah, it's temporary. One, it's temporary. It's cheap. I mean, it costs us $10 to offset a, a, the warming effect of one ton of carbon. So uh, and it's actually much cheaper for us, right? I mean, we could still be profitable at a dollar per ton. So this is a highly disruptive technology. Two, it, it is temporary, right? It only lasts in the atmosphere about a year or two. Um, maybe a little bit more, but that's it. And so there is a way to actually control this. Uh, we're not going to go full blast, right? We've been slowly building up. Our first launch had less than five grams of SO2. And subsequent launches, the largest we've had now is about a thousand grams, which is one kilo. So, um, so far, we quite frankly haven't made any impact um, on the climate in you know, all, all, all honesty, right? This has been more of a provocative provocative type of act than it has been anything else. I mean, the equivalent of like 3,000 tons of CO2 offset is about like 120,000 trees um, planted for a year, and they last for a year, essentially, uh, fully mature trees. If you want to quantify in some other way other than uh, tons, because that's kind of hard to visualize, but 120,000 trees is how much we've planted so far. Uh, it's not an apples to apples comparison, though. So um, take that with a grain of salt. Just try to normalize this. Um, the way that I communicate this with most people, uh, it's it's really interesting. The average person doesn't care about climate change. I mean, it's not there's not so much that they don't care. What we found is that they're just it's not on their radar. They're more worried about putting food on the table and paying for rent. Um, it's 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 something that is is at the bottom of their list, right? At at the top is taking care of themselves and their families and having a house over their heads. And so until until you know, their house goes underwater and it catches on fire because of climate change. Um, honestly, it's, 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 it's just something that, um, as, as you said, scientists know more about or are more concerned about this than the normal population just because at the end of the day, it's, it's a, a future problem. It's not an immediate problem like eating tonight. Um, so that's what we've observed. And the way that we've tried to communicate this is 
simplifying this, right? Stratospheric aerosol injection. What the hell does that even mean? Um, we say sunscreen for the ozone layer, right? Very simple. People understand what sunscreen is. Sunscreen lotion, right? You apply it right over your skin. And then what it does is blocks some of the harmful UV rays so you don't get skin cancer. Um, I asked chat, chat, chat GPT this, and that, that's, that's the best answer. How do you explain this to a six-year-old, to a five-year-old? And my kids understand. They're four and three, and they understand what daddy's doing. <laughs> He's launching balloons that apply sunscreen because they know what sunscreen is, right? They don't want to get burned either. I apply sunscreen before they go swim. Mm -hmm. um, these are things that need to be communicated in simple ways. Scientists, I think they have done a great job doing the research. It's just, obviously, they've been sounding the alarm for 30, year, 30 plus years now. And we're still, again, increasing our, or only increasing our CO2 output. So greenhouse gas output. So, um, and then in terms of sharing, like, what are the, what are the risks behind this? Um, the, the good thing is that, we actually know there's an analog, right? Right now, currently, there's as as Ignacio said, there's a volcanic eruption currently happening in Mexico. Um, that's a stratovolcano. So if it goes to altitude, uh, we can then observe. I'm sure there's no scientists right now flying over there trying to observe. There's cooling effects that are going to happen in the next three or four weeks um, because that's really interesting to observe. Maybe we don't have to deploy anymore, right, for the year. Um, these are things that are are we can we can we can shell, right? Um, we can pause. And so you will actually see the consequences of this volcano. <laughs> we, we will. And so we can measure that. We measured it back in 1991 as well in Pinatubo times, but I'm sure we have more sophisticated uh, instrumentation now these days to be able to measure what's been going on in the atmosphere. But in terms of large scale deployment, there's been concerns over change of weather patterns, uh, delayed monsoons. Um, a big one that everyone brings up, but is not something that anyone should be concerned about is sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide with uh, acid rain. Um, the amount of SO2 that we have to deploy at scale is insignificant compared to the levels that we, we outputted during the 70s and 80s with you know, all the coal gas, uh, all the coal plants, power plants that we had. And so in terms of, um, in terms of the risk profile, um, David Keith actually had a really interesting lecture on this where the cost to benefit ratio is one to 100, meaning that for every, um, uh, if we deploy at scale, we can save 100 lives versus one person dying uh, from, from the effects of, of solar radiation air management or stratospheric aerosol injection in particular. And so, you know, go ahead. But, but if, we, if we do, if it ends up getting deployed at scale, which as mm -hmm. you said, is illust illustrated and already there's an analog with, with volcanoes, there is some amount of risk, whether yeah. it's acid rain, whether it's respiratory illness. And yes, there is, you know, limited risk at the scales you're doing now. At larger scales, there is concern, valid concern mm -hmm. of the, uh, you know, negative implications of that at scale coming back down and, and causing damage. So how do you communicate about that? How do you address that? Yeah. And this is, this is a really, I, I, I wish I could have a better way to uh, explain it, but really it's, it's, it's a, it's a trade-off, right? If we keep doing what we're doing now, we're going to face these same, these climate disasters that you're describing right now. I mean, like this will happen to us. And so I would rather try to control it versus us just, you know, letting Jesus take the wheel here. You know, it's, 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 it's something that um, I'd rather start these small deployments now and learn and scale and do it temporarily, right? Have literally like mini volcanic eruptions um, until, until we understand the, the side effects of it at scale. Um, and so the concerns that we have, I, I live on this planet too. I'm, I'm in sunny California myself. And so, and these are being deployed in California, in Nevada, in Mexico. And so I'm doing this in my backyard. Um, it's going to affect me just like it's going to affect everyone else. Um, yes, there are studies done that the global south might be more affected. Or I'm actually, I'm sorry, the north. I believe it's the uh, the, the north will be more affected by these climate change uh, weather patterns. Um, but the south will actually benefit from this quite a bit. So, I mean, there are some concerns around how this will affect different parts of the regions of the world. But um, again, um, I live on this planet too, and so. Um, I am, I am not, not trying to do anything that will cause self-destruction. Yeah. It sounds like you're communicating it in terms of the trade-offs. Yeah. Um, and, and Leslie, 
Um, how about you? When you talk about the work that you're doing, um, do you how how do you communicate it? Um, because uh, it do you do you get feedback that this is uh, as you you described it as a band aid yourself? So how do you communicate um, the importance of um, of working on a band aid? Yeah, uh, a lot of people. Uh, really get what we're uh, aiming for in the Himalayas because a third of Pakistan has been underwater, you know, floodwaters for quite a while. And the drinking water supplies and the flooding that's been happening in India, which is the specific country we've been invited to, um, is, is just serious. It, it's serious and it's now. And so people in that region are understanding this. Um, I will say to uh, what Andrews, since we're both on this together, I, I suppose I don't surface the objections, but there are a couple of risks you're not talking about that I, I think are out there. Um, one thing that we do is we're intentionally limiting the areas in which we work to make sure there's no unintended consequences. And uh, we have this, um, ability to use climate modeling then, and a lot of people have used climate modeling on the stratospheric sulfates as well, um, to predict, you know, will there be different, how, how much impact can you have in a positive way, and will there be negative impacts around the world somewhere? Will you change a hydrological uh, system pattern uh, so that where people have counted on growing crops, they maybe can't anymore? That sort of thing. So we're we're very carefully scaling without having to scale. So you do the research and then you you get to scale it via the climate model and and these things are pretty sophisticated models. Um, you know, it's a it's it's I, I like the idea that we can help people with their resilience right now, their climate resilience right now. Should this all be working out, and that we're trying to save something, you know, ice and snow reflectivity that has been guarding us for a long, long time. These pollutants that are more and more on top of ice and snow around the world, including glacial ice, including ocean ice as well, um, we can, we brighten it up immediately by adding these materials. And these materials are hydrophilic again, uh, you know, they like, they like wet things. And so, they will stay on top of ice and snow. When, once they're there, they're, they're staying there, unless you've got a lot of meltwater. And we spent quite a bit of time, it's part of why we've been a little slow about getting to foundations to fundraise, to make sure that the materials that we want to use now for, for highly sloped glacial areas would actually stay in place. And we've just been going through a whole uh, several months uh, test of that on some sloping areas, uh, you know, again, in Minnesota, in that same homeowner's uh, yard. And it's, it's been very encouraging. So we can brighten things up pretty instantly that way. And again, no, no effects on, on ozone layers or, or, you know, uh, you know, in, interesting risks like that. There's also the other thing, I guess I am going ahead and mentioning the problems. It's been claimed by modelers and ecologists that you can have a termination effect if you stop doing some kinds of treatments. And Andrew, stratospheric aerosols have been mentioned in that. And oh, sure, the, sure. And the yeah. problem with that is that if you stop it suddenly, you've kept temperatures lower. Yes, you can cool things pretty quickly with that, with, with not so much money. But you will also, once you stop, have the temperatures rise more quickly than they would have initially, um, you know, when, than they would have over time. And that is terrible for species because the, as species are trying to migrate to the place of temperature and comfort and all, the predators and prey and the food, the, the vegetation doesn't migrate at the same time. And so you, you run the risk of much higher extinction rates. And so, you know, we, we want to do things as, as carefully and naturally as we can. I would say, you know, your cost metric is an important one, certainly, Andrew. But uh, if you look at the amount of money that NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is saying that we've had in climate devastation already in just the U.S. since the 1980s, it's something like $2.475 trillion 
of climate damages that we've suffered here for that. And when you compare, you know, even the cost of having to coat, you know, several surfaces, you know, glass microspheres in those strategic areas or, or other like materials, um, it's going to just be such a tiny, tiny thing compared to the damages that we're increasingly suffering. So, yeah, those are, those are why I think it's worth putting the Band-Aid on now. Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, it sounds like then, you know, the uh, the speed is an important factor in how you communicate the work that you're doing. Um, so we're, we've got 10 minutes uh, left and a bunch of questions. So I'm going to try and get through some of these questions. Um, wouldn't it be more effective to put giant mirrors in space, uh, make special high altitude planes? Um, run a tethered tube to the stratosphere. That one I don't completely understand, um, but uh, I guess, would it be more effective to put mirrors in space? I mean, yeah, I, guess I mean, it actually, it actually would. It actually, I mean, yeah, totally would be. Um, but right now the launch costs are too expensive. Um, again, we've only raised $1.2 million so far uh, to launch a satellite these days. I believe it's like $4 million. So um, I don't think that would be a good use of our, our funds for now. Um, will we graduate to that deployment method uh, to mitigate some of the uh, effects of climate change? Yes, if we can get there. Um, in terms of flight, yeah, absolutely as well. We have a patent strategy actually around the deployment of the SO2 itself, uh, strapping it to a plane. Um, and so these are specialized high-flying planes. You can either source them, uh, with Soviet airplanes, like a MiG-21 essentially, uh, cost about two, $3 million right now. Um, and if you want to deploy uh, you can, I mean, you would just have to, to buy a plane or hire someone to do that for you. Um, and so these are all, all things that will reduce the cost actually even further. But at this point with the scale that we can do with our the balloons, um, and we can scale pretty high. I mean, you, you, balloons were a hot topic, like back in February, uh, when they're, the U S was shooting them down. These, these, these things can carry quite a bit of payload. Um, our current payload is one kilogram, which offsets the warming effect one ton of CO2 or 1000 tons of CO2 for a year. But um, I mean, there are payloads that are in the thousands. Um, and so you can get pretty heavy. Um, and if we have deployment sites all around the equator, um, you can get, you can scale pretty quickly, um, pretty immediately if, if necessary. What, one uh, question, uh, how long do, uh, how long do the bright ice material spread over the ice stay in the ice? Ah, that is a good question. Um, what happens with this, these materials over time, at least the ones we've been using to date, is that they dissolve. Um, so uh, silica has a, a pretty big solubility in ocean water. And in fact, somebody, uh, Raquel, uh, asked a couple of questions over time about these materials here. I just saw in the Q and A, uh, and in in your marine environments, in in rivers and in oceans, you have actually a great deal of of silica materials that have washed down as part of your sediment, your silt, uh, going into these bodies of water, and then over time they dissolve into the water. And the amounts that we're looking at using are pretty tiny. In the pond experiments over time, these are disappearing. They'll blow to shore, they'll affiliate with, you know, leaves and things and, and, and they get emb embedded in the mud. Um, and then over time, they're just, uh, they're just dissolving. The, the silica actually dissolves. So there's a, and, and we don't use much. So that part is, uh, is pretty good to understand. And there was another question Oh, oh, are there other methods? There are. Uh, there's one that absolutely fascinates me, and I hope to learn from him sometime. I've used him as an example in my Stanford class, actually. Uh, Sonam Wangchuk uh, uses the hydrostatic head, so the pressure differential of melting rivers in the Himalayas, in his area of Ladakh in Nepal, to harness that and put it into a special kind of snow blower to remake snow when the temperature's cold enough. So to turn this water 
into snow, into something called ice stupas. A stupa is apparently the name for uh, a religious, uh, you know, like a temple. And the shape, it's sort of a conical pyramid, um, gets built up and it lasts longer and allows them to do agriculture up there. And believe me, I'm fascinated with this idea. I mean, anything that works, anything that works and is safe is, is high on my list of could, could we be like that too? Uh, so, yeah, um, I'm, I'm very open-minded as to whatever is going to work best. Uh, and one thing that, Andrew, you mentioned is that um, there's, uh, you know, you're letting the FAA know when you are letting, releasing these balloons. Um, I know that the project in, in Mexico got some negative, uh, you know, pushback from the Mexican government after you did that. But in terms of formal regulation on geoengineering, international, internationally, nationally, there is not a lot of clarity right now. So I'd like to ask both of you, what do you think should be the regulation of this space? Um, should it be coming on a national? Should it be coming on an international? How should we regulate this? I, I mean, I oh, go ahead, go ahead, Leslie. Yeah, Ladies first. Go first on, on this one. Um, I've been working with the AGU, the American Geophysical Union, who've been trying to come up with an update to their policy on research in these areas. And what they've concluded is that if it's a tiny enough thing and, and it, it passes, you know, general safety metrics and, and it's localized, you know, one should be able to do this, especially if you're following up with an environmental impact assessment right afterwards to be able to carry this on because things are getting stopped from any research whatsoever. Uh, many are. And so we've been lucky in that our thing is you know, our approach is demonstrably safe enough that we're getting local permissions, yay. But I'm really happy to hear that for some things, again, if they pass that sniff test, if you will, um, you know, are, are to be allowed. And the AGU leadership has voted, you know, after polling the world, basically, for their opinions as well, that, yeah, this is a reasonable approach. So that may help the general research in general out there. And I'm pleased with that. Um, yeah. So please, Andrew. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, I mean, for us, it's, it's what David Keith was trying to do, right? He was trying to get permissions from local governments. He was trying to do all these things to make sure that he wasn't stepping on anyone's toes, but ultimately he couldn't launch. Um, and so we took that and we said that signaled to us that, hey, it looks like no one's one really actually focused on this, right? We've reached out to the EPA, we've reached out to uh, ARPA, we've reached out to these the, the usual su suspects that would try to deploy this themselves. And it, it's not a focus area for them right now. And so there isn't regulations around it. Um, but, you know, we've been contacted by the FBI. We've been contacted by NOAA. We've been contacted by FAA. And I'm still here. This is my house. This is not a virtual, you know, background to some jail. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it's something where uh, we're doing this cautiously, but I'm not doing this in a haphazard way that would get me in legal trouble or if I, I mean, essentially, you know, you know, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the way to put it. I guess the best way to put it. Do you think um, there should be regulation? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the best way for us to then kind of move forward with this. Um, but quite frankly, again, like this is, this is how innovation usually works, at least in America is that first it has to become a thing and it has to become a thing that becomes a threat to the government. Like that's why Bitcoin is currently, you know, being paraded around Congress right now is because, you know, I was an investor in Bitcoin back in 2013, right? This was when Bitcoin was less than like, I think 60 cents, $200. Now it's at like 29,000. Um, and so it wasn't regulated back then, but now it's become a serious thing. Um, people have put massive amounts of wealth into, into these digital currencies. And so um, until, until it becomes a bigger concern for the government, um, there aren't going to be regulations, quite frankly. Um, and so we're going to do what we think is best to be able to deploy safely and at scale. Uh, the permissions that we get are eventually going to, to address your Mexico thing, yeah. Again, to clarify, like we never got banned. This hasn't been banned anywhere, technically. Um, they're just, as you said, deeply frowned upon it. Um, 
but we are talking to island nations right now who want this kind of stuff. And so, um, because they are the ones facing this existential threat of um, seawaters rising. So they have a much larger stake in doing this. And obviously this will cause some, might cause some geopolitical strife, but at the end of the day, um, really it's, 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 it's about, you know, what is best for their people and, you know, how can we deploy this safely? So again, it's super early right now, but we are having those conversations and, you know, we don't want to do this anywhere that's not, not invited. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. And that's where we are too, right? You have yeah. to work with the local people with their complete knowledge of what you're doing. And they know whether it's going to cause some damage that you might not be aware of as you're coming into, you know, their their ecosystem. Sure. So yeah, I totally agree with that. We've done a bunch of town halls about this, the framework. But we we've, we've done it in the US too. <laughs> so like that's the thing. Like <laughs> and we've been cocked by the usual suspects as well. So Again, like I would love regulations because it's super ambiguous for us right now. Obviously, right. like it's, but that's 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 the startup world, right? Not only are we building the road, or we're building the car as we drive it, we're also building the road in front of us. Like that's the analogy. Here. Usually, in the startup world, you just say you're building the car as you're driving, and whenever you get money, that's putting more gas into the tank. But here, we're going, we're uncharted territory. There's nothing. There's nothing really, there's no, there's no roads, there's no map here. Um, and so that's why one is super exciting to work on this. I'm super fortunate and blessed and uh, very, yeah, just very fortunate to be working on something like this. Um, yeah. So we're getting uh, to the end of the time. I want to just ask one more question that I thought might be a good uh, in the, in the chat here, that might be a good sort of um, very future forward uh, last, last question for this conversation. Um, in a hypothetical future where we have mastered geoengineering, if that should happen, could we tailor the Earth's climate um, uh, to to how we how we most comfortably want to live? Is there some potential, uh, you know, designer world that that could be uh, created? And that's for both of you. Mm. Um, I mean, the potential, uh, how far can this go, I guess, is the question. I I would say don't try to go to levels that we haven't had pre-industrialization, you know, before pre-industrial times, right? Because the earth has been in a, in a wonderful balance, uh, you know, for a long time. I, I see one more question. Uh, do the spheres float? Yes. Uh, do they have a fish impact? Uh, not that we've seen, and we've had them tested ecologically by a couple of different test labs on a on fish and bird species. And Sintef Ocean is now yeah. testing things, and they're finding no impacts in the oceans either, uh, unless you feed an egregious amount to it, in which case the species might lose its appetite for a little bit. But no, no bad things. So, but I think the idea is trying to keep this lovely, you know, balance that we've had uh over over time and andrew i don't know what your answer is but yeah thank you for letting me jump in again oh sorry what was the original question again the could, for the could, is there the potential that this could become so well developed that we would end up being able to design a future ideal climate for the earth is that something that i mean we're, we're kind of doing it already very recklessly right and so we're, we're just uh uncontrolled uh emissions of co2 um, you know, at a gigaton, gigaton scale, right? 50 or estimates are 40 to 50 billion uh, tons of uh, CO2 per year. Uh, and so we, we are already geoengineering the, the world badly. Um, and so if just like man has conquered, you know, nature, right? Ever since we decided to stop being hunters and gatherers and put plants in the ground uh, to then clear forests and grow societies, like, We've mastered the we've mastered nature, um, and it's kind of hubris to say that, but we have right. We are the apex predator on this planet, and so to to then say yes, we can change the environment, and as we have, we can also do the opposite. Um, there are some estimates and papers that have been published saying that this will have to happen for two hundred years in terms of stratospheric aerosol injection, 
uh, that's a very scary thought, but maybe that's something that we have to adopt uh, because uh, if we don't decarbonize, then that's the future that we're going to live in. But please, well, I think we'd, ha we'd zap the ozone layer if we did that. And then nothing thrives. There's no plants, there's no humans. Right. And so there's, again, there's been analogs with, you know, the volcanic eruptions and NOAA's done, done papers, published articles. I don't know if they've published papers, but the effects of SO2 in, into the ozone layer. The great thing is, I think, because of the, um, uh, all the, uh, what is it? Uh, I think it was the Paris Accord, uh, trying to ban uh, CFCs. Uh, essentially, that that kept uh, that actually rebuilt the ozone layer, and so it's fairly robust in the sense that uh, the amount that we want to deploy, hopefully, is not enough to damage it. Um, and again, I, I agree with you, Leslie. Like, I don't want to damage the ozone layer. We worked really hard to to repair it, um, and so again, this is all based off of trade offs. Um, I think I think one thing. One big takeaway from this is just we don't know what those numbers are. We have rough ideas based off of models, but um, I think when people say acid rain or when people say delayed monsoons, like everyone just thinks of the worst, right? They think of Armageddon, but that's currently already ha happening, right? It's happened in the 70s and 80s with acid rain. Somehow we survived as a, as a, as a world. Um, and also now more climate disasters are happening. And so if we want to continue that happen and have that accelerate and increase, we just keep doing what we're doing. Um, if that's the future that you want to live in, then, you know, that's, 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 I guess I, I don't know what to tell you. So, yeah. Well, yours isn't the only method to slow climate change. Oh, and that, and that's the thing. I mean, There's Leslie, I want you to be, I want you to get millions and millions of dollars of funding. I want to make sure that we can plant every single tree that we can. We can get every solar panel. We can figure out how to scale fusion. You know, all these things have to happen. I have friends, colleagues that are working on much harder problems in terms of, trying to mitigate um, CO2, right? Um, trying to switch to alternative fuels. And so it's a really exciting time, um, but we all have to work together. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, I think we're gonna wrap up here. Um, I think we're speaking of as the Montreal Protocol, by the way, with the, the Montreal letter. Protocol. Yeah, I yeah, go to yeah. Montreal Protocol. Uh, um, and you know, uh, there is, this is a, a, a developing space with lots of unanswered questions. And um, I appreciate Yay. you both being willing to field some some questions about what you're doing and discuss the very different approaches Yay. that you are taking to Yay. sort of the same reality, which is greenhouse grass emissions are still increasing and um, trying to figure out how best to, to manage that. So different approaches, same idea, more broadly speaking, and, and lots more questions to come. Thank you both. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ignacio. Um, yep. Before we stop, somebody asked a beautiful question in the Q&A. How can they support our work? Oh, uh, we're, I at, we're at brighteyesinitiative.org. Uh, and we would love your support. Um, and Andrew, I'll let you speak for yourself. <laughs> oh, thanks for the plug. Yeah, I mean, I, I already kind of plugged myself already, but we are deploying now. So if you want to come to our website, makesunsets.com, you can buy cooling credit and we will deploy it and we'll tell you when we do it. Uh, we might even have a video of it actually being uh, deployed. So um, that's where we're at right now. So check us out. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Phil, Andrew, and, and Kat for this amazing panel. And just for the rest of the attendees to know, the video of this panel will be posted at the Columbia Climate School channel at YouTube in case you want to share it with whomever you consider. And thank you very much. It was an amazing conversation. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. Thank Take you. Care. Thank Take you. Care. Bye-bye.